Do we need a new ENSO perspective? I am Mark Sponsler and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, October 27th. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. If you enjoy the video, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Click the Storm Surf icon down in the lower right hand corner of the screen. Ring the bell. You'll get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. And if you have a comment or question, please write them up down below. We'd be happy to respond. And if you'd like to make a small contribution to the cause, you may hit the super thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. With that, I'd like to thank the folks that donated last week. Our regular group of donators, our predicament, Evolution Moto, Coach Nate, and now Pierre Morton, and then also O. Dillard. Thank you all very much for your contribution. I do really appreciate it. And just a heads up before we get started, there will be no video next week. Our daughter's getting married, so it's celebration time. So we're taking one week off, but we will be back the week after that. All right, let's get to work. First up, we'll take a quick look at significant wave heights across the entire globe. Starting in the North Pacific, little gale off the Pacific Northwest generating 22-foot seas. Part of a little bit stronger system uh, over the past several days generating swell. You can see it here pushing towards or down the U.S. West Coast with a little bit of energy towards Hawaii. Some sort of a weak system here uh, east of Hawaii, not really doing anything. Remnants of what was Hurricane uh, Christy. Another sort of cutoff low here in the, say the Dateline region, but not generating anything of interest. Down south, a gale with 28-foot seas uh, aimed at Chile and a sideband energy up into Peru, but no uh, significant swell expect expected north of there. Uh, the South uh, Atlantic Ocean, small gale with some 35-foot seas, but not really doing anything. Most energy aimed southeast. North Pacific, same sort of, or North Atlantic, sorry, a small gale there with 20-some-foot seas targeting Europe. And in the Indian Ocean, again, sort of a modest to weak pattern of 20-some-foot seas targeting uh Western Australia and South Australia, but no major systems, at least at the moment. But before we get into what's coming, let's talk about what is actually hitting current conditions at buoys uh, at a selection of locations around the Pacific. Uh, we'll start at Grays Harbor up in uh, North Oregon, South Washington, buoy number 036. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy all the way up from 33.3 second period energy, which you see tiny little bit, two tenths of a foot of energy there. But clearly a good spike here in the 15 to 16 second period range. And if you were picking swell wise, it's not just one frequency band, it's the summation of all the bands from let's say like from 20 to 13 seconds. This would define one swell. You see there's another bit of wind swell here. And so that would be like everything from 11 uh, seconds down to about eight seconds, something like that. And then pure wind swell below that. This chart cuts off at five second period. That is effectively wind chop, unrideable surf, uh, you know, in, in most normal situations. So we go and try to pick out the two peaks here. Let's see how well our uh, software does. Primary swell, 9.5 feet at 15.7 seconds from 176 degrees. That's surf at 15 feet. And then secondary swell, 8.6 at 12.2 seconds from 207 degrees. 10 foot surf, that really, just looking at this, that that's 12 foot swell is really part of this other part here. And the wind swell doesn't even make the grade chop height direction, 3.3 feet from 234 degrees. That's less than five second period energy. Uh, uh, so um, yeah, energy two to five seconds. So, you know, pretty raw conditions. Anything about 1.5 feet or less is pretty clean. When you get up into three feet, it's a mess. Signific significant wave height, that's the summation 
of all the energy over this entire range from five seconds on up above 16.1 feet at 15.4 seconds. If you're a boater, that is interesting because all these waves can theoretically momentarily uh, uh, stack on top of each other. And if you're in a small boat out there, that, that could become quite uh, nasty. But for surfers, no, it is individual swell trains that matter. That's what makes the surf we ride. Heading south to Northern California, it's really North Central California, let's say near the Golden Gate, Point Reyes buoy number 029, same sort of deal. We see a spike of energy about nine seconds and we see a little bit of energy at 20 seconds and it just sort of spread all across the line. Let's see what the software tells us. 5.6 feet at 10 seconds from 293 degrees. That is actually a swell that, um, uh, um, hit yesterday and is fading. Also, in regards to the Grays Harbor buoy, that is new swell radiating south towards California from a low in the Gulf. We'll get into that in a minute. Anyway, secondary swell, 2.7 feet at 13 seconds. Yeah, I guess. You know, there's some energy further out there, but really, surf heights, about head high. That's about what it is. Then we go to Southern California, Point Loma South buoy number 191 off of San Diego. We see energy in the and eh, 19 second period range, hot, maybe mid 18 second period range, not very good, not very big, I should say. That looks like Southern Hemi swell. And then we see a bunch of other intermix swells, some, some of it wind swell, some of it energy coming from the north would be the best guess. Primary swell, three feet at 10.9 seconds from 238 degrees theoretically making three foot surf. And then there's your Southern Hemi swell, 1.8 feet at 16 seconds from 191 degrees. Uh, waist high surf, 16 seconds. Now I think there's a bunch of energy all sort of glommed together here. But if I were to pick it out, I'd say it's probably about 1.6 feet at uh, about 18.3 seconds, just looking at the graph. I'm gonna go over to the North Shore of Oahu, our final stop. Waimea Bay buoy, I'm sorry, there we go, number 106. Not a whole lot going on, just a bit of wind swell down here from 12 seconds and less. Primary swell, 3.1 feet at 8.6 seconds from 24 degrees, making surf heights. Yeah, thigh high, two and a half feet. I get, okay, uh, Hawaiian scale, it's probably chest high. <laughs> um, and then some secondary energy, 0.9 feet at 12.3 seconds, adding a little bit more into the mix. All right, so let's go look back in time. We're gonna go to a variety of locations. We're going back to Wednesday, the 23rd of October. So what was it, about five days ago? Little low spun up off of California, generating swell, pushing towards Hawaii. That swell's already come and gone. The remnants of swell. Now here's the interesting part about this. I'll just put this into motion. You see most of the energy was aimed south, uh, uh, west at Hawaii, but then let's see if I can get this step right there, this tiny little blip there, built with 20 foot seas right there, that was on Friday the 25th of October. That created swell that hit North California, mainly from the Golden Gate uh, northward, on uh, Saturday, but there were still waves down in the San Francisco area that were, you know, two or two or not even three feet overhead, maybe two feet overhead. Then also Hurricane Christy, uh, well, we'll follow its track. It right about there, it went to super typhoon status. I think it had a hundred, well, maybe not quite super typhoon, 150 mile an hour winds. But again, it was not aimed north at California, too far away from Hawaii. Uh, maybe some background swell will end up uh, pushing into the big island, but it should be pretty small at a minimum. Now this uh, system, another system, in fact, now let's go back in time, and yet another system developed, uh, we'll call it on Thursday night, pushing off of the eastern Aleutians, falling south, generating 23-foot seas. Kind of didn't look like a whole lot of anything till Saturday it wound up producing 26-foot seas and, and a little patch there to 28-foot seas. That is the swell that is hitting the, uh, the Oregon buoy right now, bound into California on Monday. You can, whoops, let's see how, there we go, the 12Z run of the mall. You see the swell front hitting Oregon, just now starting to reach into Cape Mendocino and down into you know, mainly breaks north of Point Conception as we get into Monday. 
One last look at the Southern Hemi. We're going back to Friday, the 18th of October, so even more than a week ago. Gale developed southeast of New Zealand, producing 31-foot seas, aimed off to the northeast and pretty much faded after that. And after that, we're just going through everything. We're into already Wednesday of this past week. We're looking for anything that could produce meaningful swell, 28-foot seas aimed south. There was some 30-foot seas here, but they were all aimed east and faded really quick. So really, nothing on the charts other than that one gale we just looked at. Swell from that is already hitting Hawaii, and the first little signs of it is that 22nd energy that's showing in Southern California, making for rideable swell there. But beyond, things look pretty much like the end of the season for the Southern Hemi. That's okay. Northern Hemi is starting to come on. North Atlantic, we're going back to Wednesday, the 23rd of uh, October. Florida here, a little gale developed off the coast, lifting north, producing fetch and seas in the yeah, nearly 18 to 20 foot range. Swell from this system has been hitting to some degree the southeast U.S. coast. And then you get the general pattern, everything lifting north and going pretty well off to the north, targeting uh, Ireland. Uh, but that's pretty much it about it. Nothing too solid, at least yet. South Atlantic, all right, it's getting to be kind of the end of the season there. Um, not sure how, you know, how much everyone wants to see this data uh, now that things have quieted down. But here, here's the Hindcast data anyway. If you have an opinion one way or the other, write it up in the comments below and that, that'll give me some direction what to do here. On Tuesday, we got a gale with 36 foot seas. Yeah, 36.4 feet right there. Those are the highest seas over this entire domain. Each time it steps, you can see the numbers changing in its location and the winds associated with that fetch as well. That system pretty much plowing into Antarctic ice, not really doing a whole lot. And now here we are Friday and Saturday, one more system all aimed south at Antarctic ice and not sure that a whole lot of swell is going to result from that. And same thing for the Indian Ocean. Let us know what you thought. If you find this information valuable ongoing, I'll keep doing it. But if not, as things quiet down, I might just skip it. You, you decide. You be the judge. Um, I, I am just the presenter here. So we're going into Friday and Saturday uh, a day ago. And here we are, Sunday current time. Pretty slack pattern going on. But now we'll go into the North Pacific, do our usual deep dive. We're gonna start looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales. When those gales form, it helps direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet to the south, as we see right here, just to get ourselves oriented. California's hiding under there, Baja. Why some, oh, right there's Hawaii. Uh, Kuril Islands, you get the general idea. Anyway, this dip in the jet stream, when the jet stream falls to the south, that creates like an eddy, a counterclockwise flow aloft. That also manifests itself down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. And if low pressure is deep enough, it starts generating winds. Those winds get traction on the ocean surface, impart energy to the ocean in the form of raw seas. Those seas ra eventually radiate away from the fetch area. The lesser period elements fade out, exposed longer period swell and of course that swell when it hits your beach turns into surf but it all starts with a trough in the upper atmosphere 12 z sunday that would be 5 a.m local time uh, california time there is definitely a trough in the northeastern gulf we know there are seas being generated from this and swell is actually pushing south towards the california coast but starting over in japan the jet pretty weak tries to push off japan you see it sort of split a little branch goes south and then just pretty much falls apart the rest of it meanders through the bering sea only producing this one trough here and otherwise a somewhat quiet pattern you see the the jet picking up energy on Mon's Monday. Now, that's not going to generate any swell because it's too close to the coast, but that'll make for some uh, weather here into the Pacific Northwest. You see the apex of the uh, trough here reaching down to Point Conception, maybe even into Southern California late on Monday. That should make some inclement weather, but it's kind of too early in the season to expect any major precipitation or anything from it. But the good news is looking off to the west, on early Tuesday here, we'll just go to the 12Z uh, frame. 
Uh, winds building to 150 knots, pushing off Japan. You see a trough. This is a pretty clearly defined trough developing off of Kamchatka, pushing off to the east. Uh, now also lifting north. So this looks like whatever is generated will be limited to the far northwest Pacific. Another trough builds in that. Let's go back here, right there on Tuesday night. Another pretty decent trough setting up, but pinched and pretty tight in the northeastern Gulf of Alaska into Wednesday. Another shot of weather pushing into the, the Pacific Northwest. Now notice the jet starting to look more cohesive the whole way across the Pacific. In fact, we'll just go out another frame or two here. Another trough starts building off of Kamchatka, south of the Aleutians right here, offering support for gale development. Winds in the 160, maybe 170 knot range, looking much more like a typical winter type uh, jet stream pattern, roughly energy down around 44 north, something like that, and then ridging some before pushing into the U.S. West Coast. That's on, that'd be on Saturday, November 2nd. And that pattern more or less holding as we get 180 hours out with yet another trough forecast over the North Dateline region. This looks much better than anything we've seen so far this year or this season. It's not much of a season yet. We're going to talk a lot about that as we go into the long-term forecast and what's going on. It's been in an evolving uh, situation of understanding and just trying to read the tea leaves to get a sense of what's going on. Anyway, 180 hours out, jet looking much better. Let's go take a look down at the surface. Surface level pressure, surface level winds, low pressure off of British Columbia, just still generating 30 to 35 knot. Northwest winds pushing into the coast there, generating some swell. We saw that. Remnants of Christie down here and all but faded out. Another low trying to get organized over the dateline, some sort of a tropical system off the Philippines. So we get into Monday, this low, the first low lifts off. Another low develops here off Kamchatka, lifting north by Tuesday, the 29th of October. We have 45 to 50, almost 55 knot winds out of the west. Another gale developing in the north Gulf of Alaska with 45 knot winds on Tuesday the 29th, targeting the U.S. West Coast well. The Southern System, 50 knot winds. Does it get any more? No, that's about it. But two systems in play on Tuesday. The fir this first one here falling down the coast on Wednesday, while the other one in the uh, Northwest Pacific starts to fade, but yet another system starts developing on the dateline. This one's going to be theoretically quite interesting. Starting on Thursday, Halloween night, uh, 50 knot winds over a tiny area building. You can't see it under the, the label here, but there's actually 55 knot winds there building to almost 60 knots Thursday night, pushing to the Northeast a little bit east of the dateline, lifting into the Gulf with 65 knot winds. That's that's hurricane force winds in a storm. That might be asking a bit much this early in the season, but pushing through the uh, northwestern Gulf of Alaska Friday into even Saturday. Uh, now notice the track uh, going up in this direction. There's this pr persistent sense of high pressure in the Gulf of Alaska. That again ties into, well, it's early in the season and maybe some other hints of what's coming long term. And then we get into Sunday, November 3rd. Another gale starts trying to develop in the northwestern Gulf. Not as strong as the first one, only 35, maybe 40 knot winds. It's a week out. Who knows? Too early to know for sure. But at least the pattern looks more productive. It almost looks like another system behind that as well. All right, so what effects are those winds going to have on the ocean surface? Well, you know where we're at today, so we'll just step through this a little bit as we get into Tuesday. Here we go. First gale starts building off the Krill Islands with 30-foot seas, building to the 36-foot, maybe 37 feet, and holding right around in there, maybe 38 feet Tuesday night. Seas start building in the uh, northern Gulf of Alaska in about the 29-foot range building to 36 feet on Wednesday. Two gales with 36 to 37 foot seas, providing swell potential for Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast. You see the leading edge of the swell front right there on Wednesday night, falling down the coast into Thursday morning. Now, all this is on the hairy edge of the North California swell window. That is anywhere points south of Point Reyes. Uh, north of there, 
fine, plenty of exposure, but things get a little bit tricky the further south you get there. Anyway, as we get into Friday, the next system really winds up on the dateline pushing into the northwestern gulf with 44 foot seas building to 45 feet Friday night. That would be Friday night, uh, November 1st, and then fading as it goes through the gulf. Now, again, a very, you know, anything north of about the 45 north latitude line relative to California, that's a pretty north angled swell for North California here and anywhere north of that, it's like 308 degrees. So, um, you know, the spots that can get the really north angled swell will do better, assuming this even forms and everywhere else will probably get nothing. So travel is maybe key to your strategy. Then the next system starts winding up theoretically on the dateline with about 20 foot seas over a tiny footprint. For completeness sake, we'll look at the forecast for the Southern Hemi, but the short of it is things really settling down. We're looking for anything with 30 foot seas or higher. We're already into Friday, the 1st of November, and you see just really nothing, whoop, nothing happening. So a quiet pattern for the Southern Hemi. North Atlantic, during El Nino winters, the North Atlantic doesn't do so well. During La Nina winters, the North Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, or, or the, really the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean are the focus, depending on what season it is. Winter in the Northern Hemisphere, it's really all about the North Atlantic and really focusing on breaks from here up into this region, Europe and that area. Uh, we'll see how well any of this has a footprint at this point in time right now. Not a whole lot forecast, some sort of a gale out here with 28 foot seas now uh, aimed back at the U.S. West Coast. But let's just go back just a little bit here because you notice there's some sort of fetch developing starting Tuesday targeting the southeast U.S. coast, persistent 20 to almost 25 knot east to northeast winds are forecast generating seas, really targeting Florida best, but even up to as far as uh, the, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse could get some swell from that. Then we push it on out. Things settle down a bit after that. South Atlantic forecast, well, we know the pattern is definitely quieting down. You see, we're looking for anything with 30 feet and eh, 20 foot seas. I mean, certainly for areas down in this region of South Africa, all that fetch aim right at the coast, there would be swell. You get over here on the backside of South Africa, I'm not sure how much of that wraps and you can actually see the swell front trying to creep up the coast. Again, I don't know how much of it will actually make it into breaks there though. Then finally, the Indian Ocean will roll this out. A little bit of activity currently under uh, South Australia, but seas only in the 20 foot range. We'll see if we can get anything. Another little area of 24 foot seas aimed. So South Australia for sure, down into Tasmania. Oh, and there we go. It actually pushes pretty close to the coast as well. Uh, fetch and seas near your coast is good, but after it gets within about 600 nautical miles, it tends, there's not enough distance for these shorter period elements to sort of get washed out. So you end up with, you know, 12 or 13, or in this case, probably 14 or 15 second period swell with a whole bunch of eight second period stuff intermixed. Um, uh, if you know the breaks, you would know them a lot better than I if you live in this area and you know where to go to get the surf from that sort of a situation. Local wind forecast, we're focusing on Hawaii right there in the U.S. West Coast, Point Conception there, San Francisco Bay right there, Oregon up here, that's the uh, California-Oregon border there. We see the gale, or what's left of the gale, off the, we'll call it British Columbia right now. Winds for California, pretty light along the coast. In fact, it's all pretty been pretty socked in in the San Francisco area with fog uh, all day for the most part. Why under the influence of trades, 15 knots. We get into Monday, northwest winds, high pressure, you see uh, 1034 millibar high, trying to push into the coast. Not so bad in the morning, 10 to 15 knot northwest winds. Good solid area of trades pushing into Hawaii, possibly generating wind swell. East winds at 15 to 20 knots. So we get into Tuesday, again, pretty much a windblown mess for California, 20 knot northwest winds. Trades 15 to 20 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. Next system, 50 knot winds on Tuesday night into Wednesday. Little break in the wind action for California, North California particularly, maybe southern winds right here in Cape Mendocino. 
northwest 10 knots down to about Monterey Bay and then stronger south of there. As we get into Thursday, low pressure moving into the coast, a relatively light wind regime sh south of the Golden Gate, trades 20 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. Friday, my guess is low pressure clearing out. You see high pressure trying to move isobars into the coast. That likely will help generate winds. But for the first thing on Wednesday, at least northwest 10 knots to get south of Cape uh, of uh, Monterey Bay, 15 knot winds. Trades backing off of the Hawaiian Islands, 20 knots. Then into Saturday, northwest winds, 10 knots near the coast, 15, 20 knots offshore. Trades 15 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. And Sunday, pretty much some flavor of the same sort of thing, high pressure and control, but not too horribly strong. Precipitation forecast for California. Here we are, Sunday 18Z, rain for Northern California. I mean, it's even cloudy down if you're looking north from the Bay Area. Sort of looks like it wants to rain or wanted to rain up there. Not so bad at the moment. But as we get into Monday, you see clouds, if not rain, over the Sierra. Rain pushing down the California coast. Even little po pockets of snow for the higher peaks. That looks like Mount Whit Whitney or something like that. Uh, but you don't have to get that high. We'll take a look at temperatures in a minute. But you see rain for extreme northern California. Here you go. Snow flurries down into the Sierra Monday late afternoon into early evening. After that, high pressure tries to clear things out, a clearing pattern. But then here comes another front Wednesday night into Thursday. How far south does it make it? Again, right to the Bay Area. Now, this is interesting because a week ago, two weeks ago, the limit was well, it was up here at the uh, uh, Canadian-U.S. border. Now it seems like it's somewhere around Cape Mendocino, slowly inching its way further south as we get deeper into our fall pattern. Rain even on Thursday night as far south as the Golden Gate. Uh, and, but no real significant snow event. Then high pressure takes over, and here we are 180 hours out. Snow forecast dashboard for Palisades, Tahoe, formerly Squaw Valley. Yeah, a little, uh, maybe an inch of snow on, uh, on Monday and then another bit on Thursday. Total accumulation. Well, we'll click it. Let's just see what we get here. 2.7 inches. Okay. So a little dusting of something. We're not going to do every resort because they're all about the same. And it's basically a dusting of snow in the higher elevations of the Sierra. Here's a deeper dive. This is a hikers, backpackers forecast, but it gives you a good, good kind of sense of what's going on in the Sierra. This is at the intersection of the Pacific Crest Trail running along the crest of the Sierra and Tioga Pass Road in Yosemite. So basically do, uh, east of Monterey Bay or Santa Cruz. This is the actual elevation, the black line here is the elevation of the intersection of the road and the Pacific Crest Trail. 8,700 feet, you see as we're into Monday, temperatures there falling to 20 degrees, the freeze level down to 3,500 feet for a couple hours. And then again on uh, late Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning, down to freeze level down to 5,500 feet. And the red line here is the 32 degree line consistently drop anywhere from 8,000 feet with peaks down to 5,500 feet through about next weekend. That would be Sunday, the 3rd of November. Then you see temperatures rising, temperatures along the trail, 40 to 45 degrees. I mean, I think it's pretty much too late in the season for any serious backpacking anymore. Um, but who knows if you're really hardy, it's okay and <laughs> too cold for me. Anyway, freeze level even then is up at about 10,500 feet, something like that, maybe 10,000 feet. So definitely backpacking season coming to a close, waiting for the approach of ski season. All right, so what's all this mean in terms of surf? We'll start up north, uh, Columbia River area, no break specifically, it's just a generic sort of, Are there is there potential for swell or not? Uh, surf heights 15 feet today. That swell again from the northern Gulf of Alaska is starting to hit there. That swell fading as we get into Monday and Tuesday. Next swell queued up 20 foot surf theoretically on Thursday, then fading from there. And then another pulse on Sunday. That would be the 3rd of November. Let's take a look at, oh, and you can see wind speeds actually not horrible uh, over the period. 
Uh, swell heights, first one 11 feet at 14 seconds, that's today. Next swell peaking out at 13 feet at 15 to 16 seconds on Thursday. Next one building from 8.2 feet at 17 plus seconds theoretically on Sunday. Let's see how that translates in Northern California. Ocean Beach, uh, San Francisco, surf heights nine and a half feet as we get into Monday morning from our very north direction. Also notice winds in the 25 knot range building pretty early in the morning, uh, in the afternoon. And you see when, when the swell drops out like that and the wind kicks up, that means there's piles of wind swell mixed with the swell. The model can't figure out what to do with it. Next swell comes in on Friday, November uh, 2nd. 13-foot surf, theoretically, and notice the same sort of thing. Winds start building to 23 knots, so kind of a modeled mess in there. We'll go take a look at actual swell sizes, set, uh, swell sizes, seven feet at 13 to 14 seconds on Monday. Then you got, there's also southern hemi swell mixed in here too, 1.2 feet at 15 seconds. That's coming in on like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, even into Thursday perhaps. But it's going to be buried in all the other stuff except at the most protected breaks in Northern California, you know where those are. Next wall comes in about nine feet at 15 seconds on Friday, and you see the effects of wind there, and then maybe something 1.3 feet at 21 seconds on Sunday. Hmm, interesting. Maybe real winter. Going down to Southern California, this swell here, most likely Southern Hemi swell, you still see the winds over, that's not right on the coast, that's a bit off out by the Channel Islands. But uh, what do we have? Two foot surf sort of thing and slowly trickling down. Let's look at actual swell here. 1.5 feet at 16 seconds. Uh, 1.5 feet at 14 seconds. That's on Monday and Tuesday. And then fading from 1.4 feet at 14 seconds on Wednesday and dribbling down from there. And after that, Southern Hemi pretty much over. The North Shore of Oahu, no significant surf. Oh, we see a little bit of something here on Monday, but really uh, most of the energy, this early season energy confined to the Northern Gulf of Alaska, that is east of the Hawaii swell window. But then as we get into Friday, Saturday, you see surf heights in the seven and a half to pushing eight foot range with pure swell up to 5.3 feet at 15 sort of seconds. So. Uh, otherwise, oh, actually, there is a little bit of swell health, three feet at 12 seconds sort of thing for Monday and Tuesday. But maybe for the most part, the work week, good time to work, bigger swell coming after that. And it looks like an improving pattern for the Hawaiian Islands. Quick look at the southeast coast. We're going to start at Cocoa Beach, Florida. Uh, actually, there's been a good long run of surf, a lot of northeast winds, a lot of wind swell, but any swell is a good thing. You hear see surf heights in the four and a half to five to almost six foot range on Tuesday into Wednesday and holding steady at four feet for the foreseeable future. This doesn't happen very often in Florida. Take what you can get. You also see, though, easterly winds in the... 15 to 20 knot range almost continuously. Swell height 6.5 feet at eight and a half seconds sort of thing, five feet at nine and a half seconds. Continuing in the five and a half foot range on Sunday at eight, eight to eight and a half seconds. So good steady dose of easterly wind swell. And final stop on the tour, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Surf height smaller because most of the fetch is aimed south of there. Sideband, uh, Easterly wind swell wrapping up into the outer bank. Surf heights three feet on early Monday, fading to two feet, dribbling down from there. But then with the next pulse of wind energy, more three foot surf forecast Sunday a week out. Swell hot sizes four feet at seven and a half seconds, dribbling down to three feet in the eight to nine second range sort of thing, then back up to yeah, two feet at 14 seconds, maybe. That seems a little bit suspicious, but four feet at seven to seven and a half seconds, that seems reasonable a week out. All right, let's go take a look long-term. What's going on with the MJO, the Madden Julian Oscillation, and the El Nino Southern Oscillation? And this is embedded within this conversation in the middle towards the end of it, is where we're going to start, start talking about what's going on with our understanding of ENSO, and do we need to redefine how we define El Nino and La Nina, and what are the use cases for all of that? 
First off, we'll talk about the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation. There are two phases, the active phase and the inactive phase. The active phase is our friend, the inactive phase not so much. The active phase and the inactive phase rotate around the planet from one east to west on the equator. Active phase on one side of the planet, inactive phase on the other. The active phase being a low pressure system when it moves over, let's say, the Pacific or whatever uh, ocean you happen to be living in, it being a low pressure system takes warm moist air from down on the equator, lifts it up into the atmosphere. That warm moist energy gets caught by the jet stream, energizes the jet stream, making it stronger and therefore making it more susceptible to building troughs and feeding storm development. The inactive phase does the exact opposite. It is a high pressure system. It cuts off the flow of energy to the upper atmosphere, it makes the jet stream weaker over your part of the planet and then the jet stream splits all it does is support high pressure and that does nothing for generating uh, ground swell it does okay for local short period wind swell but that's about it so here we're looking at data from the TAO buoy array a series of buoys strung across the equator this is the east pacific here west pacific here there is the equator that is new guinea there the dateline 180 west right there we're just looking at the arrows these are av five-day average winds. They're giving us a sense of what is the wind doing. And just looking at the arrows here, pretty strong out of the east in the east Pacific, pretty strong out of the east in the central Pacific, and same thing in the west Pacific. Sort of smells like the inactive phase of the MJO in that trades are enhanced. They're blowing strong out of the east. But it is not the... Uh, actual wind speeds that matter it is the anomalies difference from normal for this time of year and as we get deeper into this conversation the discussion around what constitutes anomalies and how anomalies are uh, identified is going to get very important but for right now in the east pacific anomalies moderately strong mod modestly strong out of the east in the far east pacific not so much in the Central Pacific, almost neutral, and lightly stronger than normal out of the West Pacific. That looks like some sort of a weak inactive pattern. Now remember, this is five-day average, so the center point for this is a couple of days ago. What is the forecast for the next two weeks? Again, we're looking at 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. These are the winds blowing stronger out of the east or stronger out of the west. And this is for the entire planet. The Pacific starts at 120 east, so right here, okay? And the area that really matters, the far west Pacific, the Kelvin wave generation, goes to about 170 west, so just east of the dateline. So right here is the box that matters. So we see here, going back in time into October, we've had this preponderance of easterly anomalies, inactive phase of the MJO, if not a La Nina signature in the atmosphere. Now here we go, late October into today, you see westerly anomalies pushing across the Pacific. This looks like the active phase of the MJO, but scrunched off to only having about, you know, a couple of day window here as they traverse the Pacific. Broad, when you get towards the dateline, gets pinched off, and then it broadens up again as it gets a bit uh, east of the dateline. When I talk about the Kelvin wave generation area, that is from here to here, and that seems to be the very area that this La Nina signature seems to be impacting and squeezing what appears to be the active phase of the MJO through a, like a cocktail straw as it goes across the Pacific. It's all forced through this little area choked off by high pressure and easterly anomalies. Anyway, as you get into November 1st, Looks like the high pressure regime and easterly anomalies take over again. If there was ever a window for storm development, it's starting now and will go through probably about November 1st, and then we'll see what happens after that. Here's the outgoing long wave radiation, 15 day forecast, five days each panel initial, five days out, 10 days out, 15 days out. This is from the statistical model. What does this show? Well, South America, Central America, New Guinea, the equator right there, dateline right there. The blues, more clouds than normal. Again, I talked about the active phase of the MJO lifting warm, moist air up into the atmosphere. Well, it hits the upper atmosphere, condenses, creates clouds. 
more clouds than normal and you get this blue signature, okay? That's just negative anomalies, meaning less sunlight getting through the clouds bouncing off the ocean surface. Conversely, here south of India, reds and oranges, more sunlight reflecting off the ocean surface. That means high pressure. That would be the inactive phase. This would be the active phase. So active phase in play today, continuing five days from now, 15 days from now, really fading out as you see the active phase starting to move over the maritime continent and then into the Pacific uh, two weeks from now. The dynamic model, same thing, literally showing the exact same picture. We'll see if we can do this two weeks from now. Here's the statistic model. Here's the dynamic model in close agreement. Whatever active phase we're getting, it's happening now. We've got about a week for it and then it's over. Phase diagrams for the same two models, statistic model, dynamic model. How do you read this? Well, the MJO moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent, it would be like Bali, to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, across Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. Round and round it goes. So here's where it's been. You can follow this in October 14th. You get the idea. Here's where we are today. The further the dot is away from the circle, the stronger it is. So a moderate active phase of the MJO entering the West Pacific starting now for the next couple of days, five days or so, and then quickly moving east per the statistic model over Africa two weeks from now. Dynamic model suggests it moving even faster, making it to the Indian Ocean two weeks from now. And then we have, notice down here, phase diagrams. I'll show you how to get all these charts here in a second, but then we have other models that go out even further. Oh, and I'll have to shrink this down for you. There we go. All right, and this is a collection of yet all kinds of other models. Some of them run longer, though. Uh, here you, oops, here you go. Here's one of the longer GFS models. Same thing here. Here's the real long one. Having it a month from now, almost back to the maritime continent. The ECMWF model is here, and then the long run of it. All of them showing the active phase a month from now over the maritime continent somewhere. So you can get to all this data if you are, uh, if you go to stormsurf.com, you hit the Pacific forecast, that'll get you right here to this page. And a lot of what we discuss here is all written up, updated a couple times a week. And then there's the La Nina forecast. And as you scroll down here, there is the uh, ENSO or the uh, MJO ENSO forecast, sort of a text version of what we talk about here. If you go to the very bottom of it down here, there's a link, ENSO Power Tools. You click that, and then all the stuff that we're reviewing tonight, you can view there. And so even if we don't do the video next week, you can sort of follow along yourself, test your forecasting skills. Next up, the upper level uh, precipitation potential forecast, showing areas favorable for precipitation in the upper atmosphere. South America here, Central America, New Guinea, the equator right there, the dateline right there. Greens areas favorable for precipitation, so a weak active phase suggested in the Pacific. Inactive phase, of course, building under India. Each panel, eight panels, they go out four day, uh, five days each. You see the active phase slowly easing out of even the West Pacific as we get into November 6th. Inactive phase starting to build over the Pacific. That holds into about, oh, right around Thanksgiving time frame, about like what we suggested last week. And then the active phase again starts building over the West Pacific. So you have these cycles. Active phase favorable for surf and uh, precip development, as it especially as the active phase moves south of California. That's when we're good for precip. And then the inactive phase sets up a drier pattern and less support for storm development in the Pacific until you get your next active phase coming in. Same thing across the rest of the planet. When the active phase is building in the Atlantic, or in the Indian Ocean, that's a good window for uh, storm development. Same thing in the Atlantic, where is that? Right over in here. Now the signal is not as strong. The real strongest part of it is like right over the maritime continent as it moves further and further east, the signal gets weaker and weaker. But you see in the Atlantic here, in mid-November, a pretty good active signal working its way across there. So everyone on the planet is affected the same way by the MJO. It just, the timing is a little different. 
Another uh, MJO model, this the CFS model, 850 millibar zonal winds again, the blues, easterly anomalies, but this has the MJO literally defined on it. The black line is the MJO. Solid contour, active phase, dotted contour, inactive phase. You can see with the inactive phase, you have blues, easterly anomalies. Here comes a weak, this was a weak active phase back in September with westerly anomalies. So here we go, October 12th, there was the inactive phase. Here's our current active phase today. West Pacific starts at 125 East, so from there, through to about 170 West right there. Active phase in control, westerly anomalies, but you see they're just over a thin area, big over the Indian or uh, maritime continent and broad and normal looking over, uh, you know, the East Pacific and beyond, but right in the Dateline region, which is the most important part for generating surf relative to California and Hawaii, uh, a much thinner uh, westerly wind anomaly regime forecast for the next, oh, about week and a half, something like that, uh, maybe November 5th or 6th. Then here you go, easterly anomalies setting up on the dateline, dotted contour, inactive phase of the MJO taking control into about Thanksgiving, but you see the beginnings of the next active phase forecast. Nowhere near the Pacific yet, but they're building again in that same area like the Maritime Continent or Indian Ocean, and then they start their journey the whole way around the planet. And then last but not least, the three-month CFS model. The CFS model going out three months. Pat's performance here, the forecast up here, pretty much the same as what we saw last week, maybe even a bit better, all right? Dateline runs right up the middle here, far west Pacific, 125 east, so from there into around there. That's the box we're interested in. Here's our westerly anomalies active phase of the MJO. Then the next inactive phase starting, we'll say, early November into about... Well, this says not even Thanksgiving, like the 18th or something like that in November. And then after that, now this is what the model was shown before. Last week it backed off, but now it's showing westerly anomalies pretty much from Thanksgiving on filling the bulk of the Pacific Ocean. The model's waffling, not sure what's going to go on. This all dr is driven by this La Nina pattern. In fact, let's start with the MJO here. Okay, first off, here's our active phase of the MJO right here, moving from west to east. And you see the yellows, westerly anomalies. That's supposed to continue into about 5th of November. Here's our inactive phase. You see the easterly anomalies actually develop before the active phase fades. But then likewise, when we're in the inactive phase, the easterly anomalies fade before the next active phase sets up. So the actual MJO itself sort of drags behind the wind anomalies. The wind anomalies are sort of a leading uh, indicator where the MJO itself is a lagging indicator. And I think the precipitation anomalies are even lagging behind that, but I could be wrong. Anyway, all right, so next active phase forecast setting up right before Thanksgiving. This one, large and going the whole way into the beginning of the new year in the Pacific Basin. And even after that, an inactive phase forecast with westerly anomalies still in control. It looks like a better pattern is forecast once we get to Thanksgiving. We'll see whether that materializes. Let's overlay the low pass filter here. So this is your El Nino La Nina indicator. The solid contour, low pressure bias. It's just like an MJO, but you see it lasts a lot longer. Uh, and it's centered over the Indian Ocean maritime, mainly the maritime continent sort of thing. It had two contours back in August and July. This one was supposed to last for a couple of weeks. It only lasted for four or five days. And after that, no more second contours. The other good news from this run of the model run, well, here's the high pressure bias over the dateline. It faded back the end of July. It was supposed to be in place by now. Now, and every time we get closer, the start of it keeps backing off and backing off. Now it's like November 10th. The good news here compared to last week, the high pressure bias, only one contour and not even very broad. It's supposed to stub off and stop in mid, mid to late January sort of thing. This is your La Nina signal, and this is an incredibly weak La Nina signal, at least according to the CFS model. That is good news.
All right, what's going on subsurface in the Pacific, specifically temperature rise, uh, temp temperature ranges? During an El Nino, warm water builds in the East Pacific, cold water in the West Pacific. During La Nina, warm water builds in the West Pacific, like what we're seeing, and a cooler or shallower warm water regime in the East Pacific. This is pretty much unchanged from the past several weeks, if not months. No 30 degree isotherm. The 29 degree isotherm, that's 29 degrees centigrade. That's warm water, right at 180 where it was last week. The 28 degree isotherm, Oh, it was at 170, now it's 172. So maybe trade's a little bit stronger here, pushing it off to the west. But the 24 degree isotherm, shallow in the east, but still contiguous or continuous the whole way across the Pacific. But it is not the actual temperatures, it is the anomalies, the difference from normal for this time of the year. The good news is, and we saw this last week, all these subsurface uh, buoy arrays are back up. These are the anchor lines on the buoys. The X's are the sensors strung down the anchor lines to collect data. Um, so this is great news. We have complete coverage now of what's going on subsurface in the Pacific. A little bit of warm anomalies, one degree in the West Pacific. A little tiny shallow area. You notice there are still a couple of sensors out right there. They're not going the whole way to the surface. Notice how, how dense or how many more sensors there are on some of these other lines. So right in here, maybe there's still some work going on. Anyway, you get the sense there is cold water at depth, two degrees below normal. That's not very cold. And it's just sort of smells like not a strong La Nina pattern. Data from another source, this uses satellite data as well as the buoys, suggests, yes, cold water in the East Pacific. This is the East Pacific here, West Pacific here. We're going down depth 100, 150, 200 meters. The path, the normal pathway, the thermocline falls off of the New Guinea area down this way. And this is the normal path for water migration. But there is warm water all sort of here choking off any pathway for cold water to reinforce this pool here in the East Pacific. The thought being is once all this water uh, wells up to the surface and... Uh, um, you know, uh, erupts at the surface in this area, there isn't going to be anything behind it to fill it, suggesting a rather short-lived La Nina event for the minute. Here's the satellite data used to, to marry with the TAO buoy data on that last image you just saw. This is the height of the ocean. Is it higher or lower than normal? Strip out the waves, wind waves, the tides. Is the ocean surface higher or lower than normal? And wh why would that be happening? The sphere of the ocean. If you have cold water at depth, it contracts. When it contracts, you'll have a void, and so the surface of the ocean collapses a little bit, a couple of centimeters. Likewise, if you have warm water at depth, it expands, displaces water upward. So let's get it organized here. The equator right there, date line right there. Chile, Peru, Ecuador, the Galapagos Islands, Central America, Hawaii up there, New Guinea right there, and Australia down there. But it's just five degrees north and south of the equator that really matter. Yes, you see negative five, a little pocket of minus 10 centimeter anomalies just uh, west of the Galapagos here. Here is our main pocket of 10 centimeter anomalies, bigger than it was last week, but still no 15 centimeter anomalies, suggesting most of our cold water is more out here rather than crammed up along the coast of Ecuador, suggesting almost like a Madoki La Nina, if you will. Not a very strong La Nina. It doesn't have a most, enough momentum to like mash up along the coast. So it's doing its eruption further out in the uh, Central Pacific more than the East Pacific. Not too bad. Let's look a little history of what's been happening over the past year. Upper ocean heat anomalies over time are going back a year. November 2023, this is the West Pacific, East Pacific here. The last little bits of our El Nino and Kelvin waves generated by westerly wind bursts in multiple active phases of the MJO. All warm water tapped out in the West Pacific, all in the East Pacific. Nothing but cold water in the West Pacific. Trade start, or, or Kelvin wave, or the MJO start catching that. One cold water, they call it an upwelling Kel Kelvin wave, pushes across the Pacific. Another in March, another in April, another in, we'll call it July, another in August, September. Here's where we are today. So one, two, three, four, 
five upwelling Kelvin waves. Uh, we had 10 downwelling Kelvin waves to get our El Nino going. So this is our cool pool today. Not looking particularly cold. You actually see the axis of where the coldest waters are moving further and further to the west, suggesting again La Nina not particularly strong. Next up, sea surface temperature anomalies. And this is where we start going into doing a deep dive into the discussion around do we need a new ENSO perspective? How do we define ENSO? But let's just start with the basic data. Current sea surface temperature anomalies. Warmer than normal temperatures around most of the planet, but colder temperatures at the ocean surface from an equ Ecuador out to the Dateline, and coldest from about, well, I'd say about 110 west out to somewhere about a point south of Hawaii, something like that. It is this massive warming signal over all the planet that has a lot of people concerned, and rightfully so. The point being is how are these temperature anomalies calculated? It's based using a 30-year average of what is normal for every square inch of the ocean. And then you take today's value, you compare it for the value on October 26 over 30 years for each little grid square on here, and you get a deviation from normal, and that's how this chart is built showing much warmer temperatures today than what is in the baseline, and colder temperatures, even at that, relatively cooler temperatures here over the equator, suggesting La Nina. The problem is sea surface temperatures have been getting steadily warmer over the decades. So you can see um, they've been they have found a way, I should say, even from as early as 1936, to construct what average sea surface temperatures were. Now, that, I think, is somewhat suspicious because they didn't have satellites measuring every square inch of the ocean surface up until around the 80s. But that said, this is um, the 30-year base periods, and over time, what they've been doing is every because they noticed the planet was starting to warm, what was considered normal in many locations all of a sudden became considerably warmer than normal, and it almost looked like you were in a perpetual state of El Nino because El Nino is defined by warmer than normal temperatures there on the equator. Okay, and La Nina, the same deal. But as the ocean started warming, NOAA started going, well, we got to change our base period average to com use to compare. So every five years, you see here, they started updating it. And here's the track of the warmest temperatures. Let's see, that'd be April, May, June, summer in the northern hemisphere. You see the temperatures, the, a the, the average temperature in the 30-year base period going up and up and up. It's a half a degree warmer now than it was when they first started doing this in, you know, using, I guess this was 65, uh, when was this? Uh, 46 to 75. So you get the general sense that um, a half a degree temperature difference is the difference between normal and a weak El Nino or between normal and a weak La Nina. Temperatures definitely warming. They're still using this 30-year average, updating it every five years. Now, the point being, temperatures in 1991 were a lot cooler than they are in 2020. So even within the 30-year base period, there is a warming trend baking, baked into that. So um, some sites have figured out a way to try to get around that. It's a kludge, but it's a different way. It is using uh, sea surface temperature anomaly difference from the global mean. That is, what is the global average today across the entire planet? Use that as your baseline because it is today's average value. And then you take what the temperatures are, you know, and compare it to that. And so here is that. Let's see if we can do this. And here... Here is the current image. You see everything baking warm and our La Nina signal. And then here is using that. 
La Nina actually, the La Nina cool signal actually looking bigger, where the rest of the planet, yes, it still has warming, but not nearly as pronounced. And there's that PDO warm pool still. Uh, that, that So you see it's good, but it gets rid of some of the super warm non-ENSO temperatures. Now, you know, in terms of calculating El Nino, La Nina, good thing, what it does kind of do is that sort of just white washes away the fact that the temperature the ocean temperatures are getting much warmer but it still gives you a better sense of well are we in el nino la nina and what's going on so uh tropical tidbits does this and uh there's one other website that does cyclonic weather cyclonic wx so you can check both these sites out and you can go pick through some of the data there What's the trend over the past seven days? Well, we see cooling for sure off of Ecuador, and this is the only area that matters. Five degrees north and south of the equator, and officially the Nino 3.4 region is from 120 west to 170 west. So this box right in here is what, ends, what NOAA uses to calculate average sea surface temperatures. What happens in the east, it's an early indicator, but it doesn't have nearly as much impact, at least the theory goes, as out here. You see it's almost a mix, uh, a mix of warming and cooling temperatures, suggesting almost like a neutral pattern if you were just to eyeball average it out. Let's keep going. So here is the raw values from the, uh, water temperatures in the Nina 1.2 of the area. This is the area right there off of Ecuador near the Galapagos. Today's value, 0.941 below normal, 941 thousandths of a degree, or about one degree below normal. And it's been consistently there since about the end of September. So a month, maybe five weeks, something like that. This is not the official El Nino monitoring region though. This is the Nino 3.4 region. It has temperatures one degree below normal, one, one degree and two thousandths of a degree, point of a degree below normal. So right there, again though, to be uh, La Nina, you have to be at this range, one uh, half a degree or less for five consecutive months. We didn't even start getting into the below half a degree range until September 1st. So just coming up on two months now. This suggests a developing La Nina trend. Oh, and from zero to half a degree is, that's considered normal. Half a degree to one degree is weak La Nina. Half degree to one and a half degrees, moderate La Nina. So right now, uh, it looks like we're in a weak La Nina pattern. But we look at the official sea surface temperature anomaly weekly data for the Nino 3.4 region. It's this column right here, and here's the weeks. October 16th, minus 0 0.3 tenths of a degree, where here we're at minus 1 degree. Again, back to the weekly data, 0 0.3, 7 tenths of a degree difference. That's the difference between no La Nina and moving into uh, middle of weak La Nina status. So what's going on? Well, this is corrected data. This uses that thirty that rolling 30-year base average that we're talking about. They try to correct it and account for the warming in, in the Pacific, and it seems to be understating the depth of the cooling in the Nino 3.4 region. And some would say maybe even it either understates or overstates the warming in that area as well during an El Nino pattern. Now we're gonna go a lot deeper than this. This is just the start. This is the setup for the problem that we wanna discuss. But before we do that, let's do what's, let's look at one other thing. We're talk, we've been talking about sea surface temperature anomalies. What's the atmosphere think is going on on top of it? I mean, we're split. Some of the data says the we're in La Nina, the water's cool than normal. The raw data, uncorrected, says definitely we're in La Nina. The corrected data says, eh, maybe not. What does the atmosphere think is going on? All right, so we look at the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin. Tahiti in the Pacific Ocean, Central Pacific, Darwin over the Indian Ocean. Again, La Nina is 
difference in pressure between the two oceans. If Tahiti is lower than normal compared to Darwin, you get a negative value here. Well, we're at plus 13.54. Now, again, remember the MJO can definitely affect pressure differences between the two. But for right now, plus 13.54, and it's been that way for about nine days. Where were we the past month? Well, you see it bopping around, somewhere around average, but now you get the sense that, well, we're starting to move stronger into a positive range, which would be a La Nina sort of thing. 30-day average strips out some of the uh, MJO signal, plus 5.23, where were we a month ago? 1.18, you see we've kind of been toggling around one and a half. This definitely suggests sort of an upward trend. The 90-day average takes all the uh, MJO signal out and probably leaves you let with just the uh, El Nino-La Nina signal, plus 3.24, where were we a month ago? At zero, so this is sort of trending upward. Let's go look at a graph. Here we go, so this is a little bit different data set, a little bit different version of the SOA, but still basically tracking along the same uh, path. Zero is dead neutral, plus seven is neutral, minus seven is neutral. If you're up here, you're in La Nina territory. Here is our big La Nina back in 20, the end of our three year uh, La Nina in 2022. Here was our El Nino that got started in July. Notice it died here, and we're gonna talk about that yet again. And then it came back, but very weak. This was supposed to be like a super El Nino and just totally lost its mojo. Then we've been toggling around neutral. Here we are inching up, but you get the sense if you were to draw a graph from like February on, we're heading up slightly. Is that just the fading remnants of, El, of our past El Nino fading out, or is it the beginning of something more? Well, we're going to talk about that. Here is the dilemma that's been popping up. Here is the actual water temperatures corrected. And this is, you know, I didn't make this, I, I found it, but it, it's a good illustration of what's going on. Zero. And then when we looked at the weekly values, they basically suggest temperatures neutral, maybe a little bit below neutral. But then you look at all the models and the models are suggesting something much colder going on. So what is going, why are the actuals and the models, why is there a gap between the two of them? Clearly, one of those is that the correction being used in the uh, 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 water temperature uh, values to try to get them to sit or play nice with a warming planet. And then there's yet another thing that we've talked about multiple times, the Hunga Tonga volcano. And I'm not going to get into all the details of what, there's a new paper, a fairly new paper, is released in July. In fact, one of our, uh, one of our viewers here mentioned about this in the comments section. I went digging in and it was really interesting because what they found we had been assuming after reading some other papers research papers that just suggested because hunga tonga was subsurface it spewed a bunch of water vapor into the atmosphere and the water vapor really uh normal volcanoes when they erupt they spew aerosols way high in the atmosphere and that has a cooling effect on the planet but the thought was because the volcano was a sub 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 ocean surface eruption that there weren't that many aerosols sprayed up in the atmosphere and it had, would have no effect on uh, the planet's temperature, if anything, pumping more water, uh, water vapor into the atmosphere. In fact, we actually did a, a video about this and that it might, in an, if anything, warm the planet. Now, here, this paper suggests, and you can read it here and I, I can post a link or something to it, but it basically says, not true. We did research and there was a significant amount of aerosols sprayed into the atmosphere. Not a, not a super lot, but there was enough that it's having a cooling effect on the planet. All right. And that's kind of interesting because remember, where was it? Right in uh, July in here when our El Nino was getting going and it just sort of stalled and plateaued off. So let's put some things in perspective here. I uh, have some notes. Hunga Tonga erupted the very beginning of 2022. Our El Nino started exactly a year later. 
that was all that massive rain pulling into California, massive Kelvin waves, not so much surf, but massive snow it was like a wet La Nina. It was really the start. It was the end of a three-year La Nina with the beginnings of El Nino pushing over that. All this uh, moisture in the upper atmosphere from Kelvin waves creating snow. But then as we got into the summer of 2023, you know, the La Niña's ten or El Nino's, the Enzo cycle tends to weaken. And when that did, the thought is that the aerosols from the volcano were dug deep enough into the atmosphere. It, it was starting to cool the planet and it basically cut off our El Nino from fully developing significantly, if if anything. And we ended up in the final analysis with a weak barely a moderate El Nino when it was all said and done. If anything, a weak El Nino. Why would that be? Well, if the theory in this paper about the volcano is correct, then maybe it actually did have a cooling effect, unbeknownst to anyone, that resulted in the failure of our El Nino. But what's that mean for now, when we're in La Nina? Will it actually have an ampli amplifying effect on La Nina. Okay, now let's be clear. One research paper doesn't mean anything. There are hundreds of research papers that come out on any one specific topic, and it will take years for uh, all the scientists to debate and sort of agree, disagree. I mean, that's part of the scientific process. Healthy debate about what is the right cause of any atmospheric problem and what's going on. But for our immediate needs, it kind of feels like La Nina is in the atmosphere. We see water temperatures that no matter how you parse it, be it the modified version or the old style version, all suggest La Nina, yet the ENSO, I mean the uh, NOAA corrected data here suggests no La Nina. Now, that said, you and I and anybody that observes the ocean on any regular basis, one knows for a fact our past El Nino was not at all like what it appeared it was going to be. It fully faltered. Two, we know that last spring there was a good bout of northwest winds that just would not stop. It was late in coming. Normally that stuff comes in like April, I mean in March, or even as early as late February. But it didn't start till May, but once it start, didn't start it, it didn't shut off for at least two months. It was like mid-July till finally we were in a regular summertime pattern. By then, the Southern Hemi had all sort of faltered. But the point being, the atmosphere then felt like La Nina. And even now, you're look at, we're looking at the jet stream. It's still kind of displaced way to the north. The st focus of all storms is way in the north. Not that we're not getting something. And then looking at the MJO forecast and what's going on, it all smells like La Nina, like a stronger La Nina signal than what the actual temperatures suggest. Something is fishy. Here's a sea surface temperature forecast, uh, a sea surface temperature anomaly forecast from the CFS model for the Nino 3.4 region. Temperature is going down to minus 1.2 degrees in December and January. That's uncorrected. Using their correction model, and I'm not sure if this is the same correction model as what they've been using on the sea surface temperature, weekly sea surface temperature data, but this suggests temperature is only going down to one degree or maybe 1.05 degrees below normal. Then here is the subsurface temperature forecast uh, for the Pacific. So this is kind of hard to read, but this is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here. This is November. This is what's been going, this is for the whole planet, but the Pacific is right, and the dotted line is the date line. Here is November, warm temperatures in the West, colder temperatures in the East, and you can just go month by month. You see the warmer temperatures building, choking off the cold water supply, and our uh, La Nina cold signal in the east is gone, pretty much gone by February, by March, April, May. It almost looks like a, La, a back to an El Nino-ish type pattern. That's probably not true. Now, there is no uncorrected version of this, but here are precipitation anomalies, uncorrected. 
all right? Drier or drier than normal conditions in the southern tier states, wetter normal in the wetter than normal in the north in November, December, January, February, March. You know, this is a pretty typical La Nina pattern. And then the corrected version of that same chart. November, pretty much neutral. December neutral, January neutral, February neutral, March neutral. I mean, little pockets of not even, I mean, white is barely, it's pretty much neutral and the gray is neither here nor there, standardized. So it's a difference between dead neutral and a, str a stronger La Nina signal. All right, so it's, where does that put us? I mean, the immediate news is we're moving into the active phase of the MJO. There is a series of gales forecast. Again, rather north angle, all smelling like one, either very early season sort of pattern, and here it is late October, um, or a La Nina influenced pattern, okay? There is surf coming, that is good, and maybe some bigger than normal surf, but all on a rather northerly trajectory as compared to normal for this time of the year. Um, per my faltering memory recollect elections, but still, okay, that is what it is. Then there's this whole debate about, well, how are they doing corrections on a warming planet? And I'm not finding fault with NOAA because everyone's trying to struggle to keep up because the planet is changing incredibly fast. And what does this mean for our snowfall, especially in the Sierra? Well, the uncorrected version says, hey, it's a normal sort of pattern. The correct, or, uh, the, the uncorrected says, I'm sorry, much more precipitation to the north, dry in this area. The corrected version says pretty much business is normal. So that is the difference between maybe 60% normal snowfall in this year versus 100% normal snowfall. That's a big deal. And from a surfing perspective, I think this corrected versus uncorrected thing is, is a big deal too. It's the difference between a normal surf year and a surf year that maybe is much less than normal and is more the storm trajectory more northerly displaced. I actually updated the long-term surf forecast for this winter on storm surf in the long in the Pacific forecast. I knocked it down from a four to a three out of ten, suggesting a stronger La Nina. After I sort of sat and thought about all this and looked at all the data, again, it's not scientifically, it's it's a sticking your finger up in the air and just sort of feel the atmosphere and what do you think is going on. Um, so it's not nearly as scientifically based as what NOAA is trying to do. And again, I am not finding fault with NOAA. They are uh, doing the best they can in a rapidly changing environment. But what I am trying to do here is paint the picture of why are things the way they are and why are some of the forecasts not completely mapping up with, with what we're seeing in reality and what are the challenges of trying to true all that up. And all I can say at this point in time is, one, I think the volcano had a piece in all this, and it's sort of skewing everything. And in fact, maybe, you know, no one knows this. This is science in action on the ground. There probably are more aerosols in the atmosphere, and I think it dampened our, our El Nino, which was supposed to be a pretty solid El Nino, and I think it's going to amplify the La Nina in this pattern. The interesting news around that, in fact, one other piece of data, and the PDO, and I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole here, but last week we talked about how deep negative the PDO is, minus 3.54, and it's been like, you know, 50 or 75 years since we've been that low. The volcano erupted, what was it, in, uh, uh, I don't even, oh, here it is, uh, 2022, January 1st of 2022, so right around in there, and Everything was pretty much hanging neutral, but now even the PDO, I think, is reacting to it. The question is, how long will the effects of the volcano and its cooling on the planet last? General rule of thumb is about two years, so maybe this winter will be the worst of it. Now, another interesting point to consider. If our El Nino, which was a super El Nino, got muted because of the volcano, all that heat in the oceans is still there. It was not able to be released because that's what El Nino does. It's a way to, to vent off heat buildup in the planet. It didn't get its chance, so it's still simmering. 
is another El Nino coming? And would it would it now not be stronger than normal than what it normally would be if last year's El Nino had gotten to do its thing? Something to consider. And part two, with the PDO being so negative and being negative since ni- uh, 1998, would this not perhaps be a stepping stone, all that build up latent heat energy, to perhaps swinging the PD over into the warm phase? We don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to try to pretend that I do know. But there is an interesting confluence of environmental factors intersecting at this point in time, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this all plays out. All right, that's our forecast for this week. I know we ran long. Consider it like two weeks uh, since there won't be a forecast next week. You're getting two doses in one. But if you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Hit the Storm Surfer icon in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. If you have a comment, and I'm sure a lot of you are after this, and I'll do my best to deal with all this while I'm trying to do some wedding celebrations. And... um, And if you'd like to make a small contribution to the collage, you may hit the super thanks button down below the heart with the dollar sign in it. With that, we are finally signing out for this week. Have a good week. Get some waves. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks so much for watching.